May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm sure you've all heard the phrase that absence makes the heart grow fonder. Perhaps this is the dynamic that was at work in our first gospel or our first reading this morning from the book of Genesis. We hear the story of Joseph, of the amazing uh, multicolored coat fame, uh, encountering his brothers in Egypt and a great reconciliation taking place. You may remember the story of Joseph. Um, it's one that we probably uh, learned about in Sunday school. Joseph was the youngest of his father Jacob's 12 sons and Jacob's favorite. And his older brothers resented this status uh, that Joseph shared with his father and uh, his favoritism. And uh, one day, Jacob calls Joseph to him. Joseph's older brothers are out tending the flocks, um, and Jacob wants to know how they're doing. So Jacob sends Joseph to check up on his brothers. Joseph obeys his father and goes in search of his brothers and eventually finds them. And as he's approaching them, the brothers conspire together to do away with him. They are sick of his favored status, are jealous of him, and so their first idea is to kill him, throw him into a pit and let him die there. And they go ahead and they do this, they, they, they grab him and throw him into a pit, but then they have second thoughts about that, that the blood of their brother will be on their hands and they don't want to live with that uh, memory. So they instead see a passing band of traders heading on their way to Egypt. And so they pull Joseph out of the pit and they sell him to these traders as a slave. And that is how Joseph winds up in the land of Egypt and through a series of events becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man, the Lord of all Egypt. And it is in that status that his brothers have now journeyed to him. There is, as we hear, heard in the reading, a, a great famine in the land. It's been going on for two years. And so Joseph's older brothers have come from their home down to Egypt, the breadbasket of the Middle East, uh, to try and find grain, to try and survive. And Joseph hears of their presence and calls them to him. And this meeting that we read this morning takes place. And, and you can understand the trepidation and the fear that must have gripped Joseph's brothers. Here is their brother who they betrayed and sold into slavery, standing as the Lord of all Egypt. He clearly has the power to do whatever he wants to them. And what does he do to them? He loves them. He reconciles with them. And they are overwhelmed. They are overwhelmed. They can't imagine that Joseph is actually doing this, that he has found within himself the grace to forgive their awful deeds and to love them. And yet here it is. Perhaps it was that great story that Jesus had in mind as he continued his Sermon on the Plain that we read from Luke's Gospel this morning. You may remember last week that Jesus was talking about those who are blessed and those who are cursed, the rich and the powerful and those who have plenty. Woe to them, but blessed are the poor and the hungry, for they will be blessed. Jesus goes on in that sermon to, to talk about some of the things that are required of those who will follow Jesus, who will be children of the Most High. And they are outrageous, aren't they? Love your enemies. Forgive all. If someone takes your coat from you, do not withhold even your shirt. Jesus goes on to talk about these not only as suggestions, but as, as commands, as things that we must do. Be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful to you. We all know from our own human experience, don't we, just how impossible these things that Jesus is commanding us to do are for us to accomplish. I mean, the reality is, if you're anything like me, we have trouble forgiving even those we love our spouses, our, our children, our, our friends, our family. When someone offends us and hurts us deeply, 
our first impulse is not to immediately forgive them, is it? It's to stew. It's to it's to find some way to at least measure out an equal dose of pain for them. By the grace of God, we finally come to a place of realizing that this relationship is too valuable to us to to throw it away over a hurt. And we forgive, we enter into reconciliation with those we love, but to love our enemies, to forgive even them? Can you imagine? So what are we to do? As I said, these are not suggestions from Jesus. These are commands. Love your enemies. Anybody successfully carried that out recently? (laughs) All order, isn't it? Which is why I'm grateful for this third reading we have this morning from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And when I first began looking over the lessons for this week, I was kind of puzzled why this passage was in there. And we've been reading from Paul's first letter right along, and this is a continuation of that. But it seems an odd uh, passage to have in the midst of these two stories, these two passages about reconciliation and love and mercy. Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead. And somebody in the church has posed a question to him, what will our bodies look like in the resurrection? What will we be like? Will we look like we look on earth, only in heaven? And so Paul lays out his understanding um, of the resurrection that this earthly body that we travel around in is is simply a seed, a shell. That when we die and are placed in the ground, new life will rise up out of it. We will be reborn in a new form. We will not look like our old husks looked. We will be a new being. And I'm grateful for this passage in the midst of our struggle around reconciliation and forgiveness and loving our enemies because it draws us to this place of recognizing that we are more than our physical being. You know, we are not physical people who occasionally have a spiritual experience or tap into some spiritual power. What Paul is reminding us of in this lesson is that we are spiritual beings. That is our core. And we happen to be, for a time in our life, enfleshed, incarnate. We are spiritual beings, first and foremost, who live in a physical form for a certain number of years upon this earth. But our faith proclaims that when our body lies in death, our life continues on. This is just a chapter. And and yet, it's what we focus on all the time, isn't it? I mean, our physical realities are what we obsess about. It's all we think about. And occasionally, you know, we get around to prayer or to contemplation and, and remembering that we do have a spirit given to us by God that's what animates us, makes us who we are. We remember that on occasion. But most of our time and energy is obsessed with, spent thinking about, dealing with, our physical realities, isn't it? That's what we put as primary in our daily activities. You know, for most of human history, human beings thought that that the sun and the moon and the stars revolved around the earth, right? And it makes sense. I mean, when you look at the sun's passage through the skies, well, yes, it revolves around the earth. We are the center of all that is. It wasn't until Galileo came along and said, no, you got it wrong. We revolve around the sun. It's that same kind of thinking at work when we think about who we are as human beings. We think everything revolves around our physical state. It doesn't. It's only a temporary shell. Who we are is spiritual beings. We are the very image of God. Imago Dei. That spirit has been planted within you. It is what gives you life, 
It is your life. When we begin to realize that, we begin to think about that, what that means for us as human beings, then all of a sudden these lessons this morning take on a different tone. You know, I don't, I don't think it was Joseph in his physical strength, his own humanness, who was able to forgive his brothers and reconcile with them. It was the spirit of the living God working in him and through him that enabled him to reach out his arms in love and not to cast his brothers down. I think they didn't recognize him initially because he looked so different. The spirit of the living God was at work in him, had transformed him. He was their brother. They should have recognized him, and yet they did not. When we begin to think about those things that Jesus has asked us to do, to love our enemies, to forgive those who hurt us deeply, to be merciful as God is merciful, it is not through our own strength and will that we are called to do that, but by the power of the Spirit implanted within us. It is only by that power that we can do these things. I mean, that is a reality we all know deeply, isn't it? And that is not to say that our physical being doesn't matter, that what happens to our bodies, what happens in this world around us, is inconsequential. I mean, God has created all that is, and God has called it very good. So our physical lives, our creation, the world we inhabit, is beloved of God. It matters to God. All Jesus is trying to do is get us to remember, at our core, who we really are. And that our care for the world, our care for one another, our care for ourselves, flows out of that spiritual reality and not the other way around. I am overjoyed to see you here physically this morning, especially after the last two years, right, when so often we couldn't do that. Seeing your faces, looking at your bodies, having your physical presence here is a joy. We celebrate that, don't we? It is not inconsequential. So it is good that you are here physically. But what is most exciting, what is most powerful, what gives us the most hope is the spirit that you bring into this place, the spirit of the living God that is within each and every one of you. That is what animates this place. That is what gives this place the possibility of becoming the kingdom of God, builders of God's kingdom here and now. It is never through our own strength, our own might, our own will, that we accomplish anything. It is only by the Spirit of the living God within us that we can do any good, that we can love even ourselves, let alone one another or our enemies. And I know you've all had experiences of that. I know you have had moments when you didn't know what to do. But the Spirit of the living God within you responded in the moment, and grace happened. Healing took place. The right words were spoken. God was revealed. We have all had those moments. The Spirit of the living God is within you. Yes, you are incarnate. You have a physical body with physical needs and concerns and worries and anxieties. All of that is true. But never forget who you really are. And never forget the power that you possess to inhabit this body with the grace of God at work in you and through you. That is who you are. Amen.